So what is VXLAN? VXLAN is a technology that allows you to extend layer 2 over a layer 3 segment, typically used in a data center. It utilizes all of the bandwidth of the uplinks, because these are layer 3, so they won't be blocked by span entry. It also gives you the flexibility to extend layer 2, not in a typical way of trunking across several bits of hardware. It relies on two tunnel endpoints, so your switches at the endpoints need to know about VXLAN, whereas all this stuff in the middle doesn't need a care. So in this video I'm going to give you a high level example of how one host contacts another host using VXLAN. If you want to see more videos like this, don't forget to hit the subscribe. To put this into some context, I'm going to start with a VLAN example. We've got two hosts, two switches. Host 1 connects to switch 1, host 2 connects to switch 2, and there's a trunk between both switches. Everything's in the same VLAN. Both PCs are turned on, and both switches don't know about either of the PCs. Host 1 tries to communicate with host 2, and it sends a frame into switch 1. Switch 1 receives the frame, places the source MAC address of host 1 into its MAC address table, and doesn't see anything for host 2. So it sends out a broadcast which is flood across all the ports that belong to the same VLAN of host 1. Switch 2 receives the broadcast from switch 1, inspects the MAC address, and places that into its MAC address table, which is host 1's. Switch 2 then does a broadcast out of all of its ports that belong to the same VLAN and host 2 replies. The frame comes back into switch 2, which it then places the source MAC address of host 2 into its MAC address table and forwards that on to switch 1. Switch 1 receives the reply and places the source MAC address of host 2 into its MAC address table. It can now forward the frame that host 1 initially sent. So that's an example of how two hosts speak to each other in the same VLAN. I gave that example because VXLAN essentially does the same thing. For our VXLAN example, we're going to have to update our initial topology. Our switches are now going to have programmable fabric in them, which is a great marketing term. And for this example, we're just going to say that allows it to have more features, which is VXLAN. We're going to remove the trunk between those switches, and we're now going to connect them up to a spine switch, which essentially is a layer three device that's capable of supporting our needs. The VXLAN stuff all happens on the leaf switches. The spine doesn't actually need to know anything about VXLAN. Putting a disclaimer here, that's if you don't use any VXLAN on the spine. We need to put some initial configuration on before we can use VXLAN. So to start with, we need to IP address our uplinks. We need to introduce some loopback addresses on the devices. We need to make sure that there's routing across all of those IP addressing so we can use OSPF or even static routes which will create our underlay network. Our simple underlay network is nearly configured. The next thing we need to think of is how does broadcast get over these layer three links? The way VXLAN does this is with two methods. One is to use multicast, the other is to use ingress replication. It's one or the other, and in this example, we'll be using multicast. With ingress replication, what it does is it uses the broadcast frame, replicates that into unicast, and fires that out to all of the other VXLAN tunnel endpoints. So it creates more bandwidth on the links, which isn't the best thing to do, but sometimes people can't introduce multicast to their network. VXLAN will use multicast to get around the constraint that layer two gives us with bum traffic, which is broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast traffic. In our example earlier, where switch one didn't know the destination MAC address for host two, it created a broadcast this is exactly the same with VXLAN. However, that switch, instead of flooding it out at trunk port, it floods it out its VTEP, which is the VXLAN tunnel endpoint. That VTEP has then got the capability to take that broadcast and propagate the information using multicast. So we need to configure multicast across our spine and leaf switches, with the spine being the RP. The underlying network is now configured, so we can introduce the VXLAN. First, you map a VLAN to a VNI. VNI is essentially the VXLAN number. So we can map VLAN 10 to VNI 10,010. That 10,010 number is globally significant. So all of your switches are going to have to share that if they're going to be in the same VXLAN. The local significant number, that VLAN 10, can be different on any of the switches. It's the VXLAN VNI number that you need to worry about. What I mean by that is VLAN 10 could be mapped to VNI 10,010 on switch 1, 
on Switch 2, it could be VLAN 20 mapped to VNI 10,010. Because they both belong to VNI 10,010, they can both communicate to each other. It doesn't matter that they're in different VLANs. It shows you it can be done, but it probably isn't best to mix and match if you can help it. With the VLAN to VNI mapping complete, we can now configure the VXLAN tunnel endpoint known as the VTEP. The VTEP is the exit point for the local switch for one VXLAN to get to the same VXLAN that sits on a remote switch. So essentially we have two tunnel endpoints and a tunnel connecting those endpoints together. That's known as the overlay network. It's the same concept as an IPsec tunnel for example. If you have two firewalls with an IPsec tunnel over the internet, the internet is the underlay, the IPsec tunnel is the overlay. By default, the VXLAN tunnels are not encrypted, however you can choose to encrypt them. Each of the VNIs need to become members of the VTEP. Once they're a member, they then need to join a multicast group on each of the VNIs. If VNI 10010 joins the multicast group 239.1.1.1, then that needs to be in place on every single leaf switch that has VNI 10010 on. This is so the broadcast can be propagated to each of those VNIs. Each of the different VNIs can join the same multicast group. This is because when the VTEP receives a multicast packet, it inspects the VNI of that multicast packet and decides whether to propagate it if it matches or whether to drop it. With this in place, we can now give an example of host 1 communicating to host 2 across this network. Host 1 sends a frame in to switch 1. Switch 1 adds the source MAC address of host 1 to its MAC address table. Switch 1 doesn't know host 2's MAC address, so creates a broadcast. Broadcast is forwarded out of all of the ports that belong to the VLAN that host 1 sits in. That VLAN is mapped to VNI 10010. VNI 10010 is a member of the VTEP, so that broadcast is then forwarded out of that VTEP. The VTEP encapsulates that frame with a VXLAN header, a UDP header and the IP header. Also an outer MAC header. This is then forwarded out via multicast to the RP. The RP sends a copy to each of the VTEPs which have joined the multicast group. In our case, switch 2's VTEP. There is additional payload to consider here, so the MTU needs to be increased or decreased on the hosts. Switch 2 receives the multicast packet on its VTEP. It inspects the VNI and has the member so it decapsulates the packet. It now has the initial frame that was sent from switch 1. It inspects the frame for the source MAC address and maps it to its VTEP. Host 2 then replies to this broadcast. When switch 2 sees the reply come through, it adds the MAC address to its MAC address table for that interface and forwards the reply via its VTEP. Before it's forwarded out, it gets encapsulated again with a VXLAN header, UDP header and an IP header. The destination IP address will be the VTEP of switch 1 and the source IP address will be the VTEP of switch 2. Because we correctly configured the routing on the underlay network, the underlay is able to forward this traffic. Switch 1 then receives the packet, it decapsulates this and inspects the reply and is able to add host 2's MAC address to its MAC address table, assigning it to the VTEP. Communication from host 1 and host 2 is then able to be done via unicast. When the unicast between host 1 and host 2 is sent, it goes through the VXLAN encapsulation and decapsulation. So we are still having to use flood and learning to propagate our MAC address tables. That's acceptable in a small environment such as this example. However, when we start to add many devices, the flood and learning is going to become more and more prevalent. To reduce the flood and learning, we can use BGP EVPN. BGP EVPN allows the switches to share the information they learn from the flood and learn process. This allows this solution to become much more scalable and much more effective with allowing each switch to propagate information that they know in their MAC address table, which in turn makes this solution much more scalable. I may have gone a little bit too detailed in some points in this, but I think it's about as high level as I can go. I hope the video's helped you, and if you do find it useful, please give me a thumbs up. If you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to the channel. If you want to reach out to me, leave a comment in the section below, or reach out to me at Lewis Bank on social media. My website's lewisbowerbank.com, please check that out, and thanks for watching.